Morning, everybody. Uneducated Economist here. So let's see here. What should we talk about a little bit before we get started? Um, yesterday, we went up to the Oregon Historical Museum, which was really kind of a lot of fun. They did have some of it, some of the exhibit shut down for, I don't know, rebuild or whatever they were doing. So it wasn't that the entire place was open to walk around in, but what was open was, was pretty neat. Um, the one thing that I found interesting there, or at least my wife pointed it out, was um, a gold coin that was used in Oregon called the beaver coin because there was not enough like currency to use. There wasn't enough money to actually use for commerce. So Oregon minted out these gold coins called beaver coins, and apparently they were illegal from the federal laws and stuff at the time. So anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. Maybe we'll do a video talking about the um, the beaver coin later in you know when i figure out a little bit more about it but uh i thought that was pretty cool and then um let's see the entire experience up in portland was pretty cool we went to the lloyd center again just for uh just for fun just to go check out and see what it looked like in there and place was dead my mom who's from southern california and hawaii you know that's where she spent a lot of her time she was just absolutely blown away on how little there was going on in the mall it was so quiet and hardly anybody there and like I don't know, I would say probably only a third of the places were actually open. Most of the storefronts were closed and just had nobody, you know, nobody working them. So um, pretty interesting to go there. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just an overall pleasant time. You know, it was uh, the weather was nice. So that was a lot of fun. OK, uh, let's talk about this. Uh, some of the job lists that's taken place or some of the incoming jobs that we're supposed to be hearing about from like the returning from offshoring jobs. And now I'm a little concerned about the jobs that are coming from the bringing back from offshore. I'm not quite sure how to state this because really what I believe has happened is, is that because of the supply chain breakdown and because of how hard it was to get things through the system, that a lot of times people are probably looking at what is like a returning from like overseas jobs in manufacturing as like this good thing which it is a good thing i mean in in just view of it but really what's happening is is that they are trying to take it they were trying to figure out what it was that they were going to do about a supply chain breakdown and so they started making decisions that said okay well we're going to have to bring these the production closer to our consumer because we can't seem to get it through the distribution network efficiently well, eventually the distribution network will open up and the people who have reestablished manufacturing in a more expensive area trying to get it closer to the consumer are going to have to compete with cheaper man or cheaper distribution from overseas. That was my major concern coming from it, from the reshoring of jobs, if I'm stating all that correctly. I don't know. I'm kind of fumbling through my words. Maybe I need to drink this coffee a little quicker. Um, but... What we're seeing on the flip side of that is go and check out the articles that I leave down in the description because I have articles for all this too. Is that, what was it, half of businesses are expecting layoffs? The one surveyed in this, in this survey, or actually in this article that um, surveyed like these businesses, and half of them are expecting layoffs. So you think about it, even if you are returning jobs to the United States, these jobs probably are going to be competing with you know, easier distribution that eventually will come. And at the same time, you're going into recession and businesses out there aren't feeling real comfortable about what's gonna be happening here. And the easiest way to keep your business going, especially if you are majorly indebted business, is to start selling your assets, cutting jobs, doing stuff like that. And so layoffs are almost a guaranteed to come eventually when you have a recession, which most people are expecting. And now you can kind of see the effects of some of this stuff when you go in, again, like I'll leave links down in the description for all this stuff. You can kind of see the effects of some of this stuff when you go and you look at China. I've said it many times, the things that are taking place in China are eventually going to find their way around the world. And look at some of the things that are taking place there right now. You got young people who are looking for jobs and you have luxury items being sold for 50% of what they were just a few months ago and even years ago. So you can see the luxury items are being dumped over there and the young people are looking for jobs. And I have a feeling something very similar to that is going to happen here in the United States as well as the recession really starts to kick in. And we know from 
just from some of the things that the Federal Reserve has stated that they are going to continue to lift interest rates. And when you think about how the Fed funds level when they lift interest rates takes six months to a year, they just hit neutral. In six months to a year from now, we are should be expected to see what neutral would look like in the economy. And I don't think people are people are quite prepared for it. So anyway, what are you guys talking about? 160 of you up in here. Please go hit the like button if you can. It'll start spreading the video around. We'll get more people up into the chat. Hey, UE, can talk about how environmentalist laws have affected the lumber industry up in the Northwest. You know, I wish I knew a little bit more about the actual environmental laws. I know some of the things that have taken place up here have, you know, because each state is a little different on how their laws are, are written. Um, like, just for example, from from what I understand here in Oregon, or at least in the area that they log here, that cutting trees within 20 feet of a watershed, so like, you know, you have the water runoff coming off the hills, you can't cut any closer than 20 feet, right? But that is so close to these watersheds, it's like almost as like, might as well not even have a barrier. In some other areas, it's a lot. It's like 50 feet or even more. And so I think about some of the environmental laws that are here in Oregon compared to some of the other states that are out there and why it is that Oregon was the number one producer of, of lumber in, you know, in the country. Now, that could be one of the reasons is that it's easier and cheaper to, to log here in Oregon than it was in other states. I don't know if that's necessarily the case any longer, but, you know, that could have been at the time. Anyhow, um, that's about all I know about. I don't know much about the, the environmental laws. Um, you know, I have thought about how these environmentalists and the green movement is going to push a new building industry, the cross laminated timber industry, which I think is actually going to be a growing, growing trend, um, <laughs> pun, right? Uh, a growing trend within the, uh, not only the timber industry, but the building industry and everything else, because you think about it, it's like when you, when you build with wood. Okay. So if you're not familiar with the cross laminated timber industry, I guess I should kind of talk about that is that um, the cross laminated timber industry is when they build high rises or apartment complexes or just institutional facilities all out of wood, out of 100% wood construction. And they figured out the fire, the bugs, the rot, they figured out all that stuff. And they're using it as a green product because once those trees are cut, you're locking the carbon up in the wood. And unless it either burns or rots, <clears throat> the carbon will stay locked up within that wood that's in those buildings. So it's being pushed as like a carbon locking product, you know, or, or, you know, building industry. So I found it interesting that they are pushing this as a green product by cutting down more trees, which I thought was kind of fun, you know. So anyway, that could be a, a nice way to boost the uh, timber industry. All right, 173 up in here. Still only 62 likes. Come on, guys, go hit the like button, please. All right, I don't know why I'm begging. Don't, I don't care if you hit the like button. We're hanging out, right? I'm going to be out here for a little while anyhow. Uh, China housing market about to fall apart. Housing drives the economy. Yeah, cause, well, you think about it. Like, you know, there's really no other industry that's more domestic than building. Like, you know, almost all the product is comes from domestically made sources. You know, I mean, a lot of the amenities and there is like the Chinese Jai Wall, you know, thing that happened and stuff like that. But for the most part, most building industry happens domestically, like the production of it, the labor of it, everything is like, you know, a, a homegrown domestic product and it doesn't go anywhere. It's like, you know, it just stays right there. So no matter what you build, it's like, you know, locked into your, to your location. You know, I think about that because like, there's a really nice building that used to be a lumber yard just down the road from, from me here. And, um, the Maritime Museum owns it now. But I think about the debt that it took to build this thing because it's really nice. It has like heated floors and murals all over the walls. And it's just like this really nice building. And I think about the amount of debt that it took to get into that. And then it went bankrupt, right? The guy who owned it, you know, they eventually the uh, the company had gone, had gone bankrupt. And I guess it went up for auction and the Maritime Museum had purchased it. But now this big, beautiful building was there that I think was purchased for, you know, obviously for less than than what it cost to build it. But now it's here, right? Like the building doesn't go anywhere. This beautiful building will always be here. And anyway, I found that to be kind of like, you know, interesting when you think about like, cause I've always thought about it like debt being like a, 
almost like gardening, like farming. You know, so you have like this recession where you wipe everybody out, but then you got the new debt that comes in. That's like planting of the seeds. And then people take that out and go and build, you know, beautiful buildings and buy cars and, you know, do awesome stuff with this debt. And then it gets to a point where people can no longer afford it. They turn off the new money. So people really can't afford to make, make their debt payments. And then they start losing it all. And then the people with the cash, the rich come in and start buying it all up. And that's kind of like harvesting, right? So you got the debt that's seeding it and you have the time that it takes to grow it. That's people building all this stuff up, gets to a point where they can no longer afford it. And that's harvesting. And then they cut it all and people lose all their stuff. And then the rich come in and buy it all up for pennies on the dollars. Okay. I saw a vid, empty apartment buildings getting demolished. Reminded me when the 70s, the Brazilians burned coffee to hold the price up. <clears throat> Yeah, I saw those too. Um, Mom actually was showing them to me, and uh, I don't know—is that the was that really happening, or was that like you know propaganda, or was that what was happening there? A story had potential to be San Francisco before the San Francisco. Hey, UE, are you still calling bingo? Yeah, I'm calling bingo. Be calling bingo tonight. Of course. It's going to be tough to get in there because it's going to be a crowded night tonight. If you're going to go play bingo, I suggest you got to get down to the workers probably like at least 5 o'clock. It doesn't start till 6.30, but you're going to have to hang out for a while if you want to, if you're going to want to play. Uh, let's see here. Gosh, I can hardly read the screen. Is anyone building with hemp? I, I've seen the hemp building product, but I have yet to see how it's turned into any kind of like common building product. You know, it's just like this. It's more of just a concept building product, right? Uh, rich, poor spread gets too big. Domestic disputes happen. Other countries see the weakness and strike. Yeah. I miss meat bingo. I I miss doing the live bingo. Um, that was a lot of fun. I got to talk to the owner and see what I can do about getting that up because that was going to turn into a real show. I mean, that was going to be bigger than the uneducated economist was. <laughs> All right. Um, how's your house coming along? It's going really well, man. Um, thanks for asking. It's it's actually really pleasant. It's a really nice neighborhood. Um, Everything's going well. I don't know if I'm going to get to the roof this year, though. I probably should if I can, but I don't know. Metal prices are still way up. I was going to do part of it in a in a metal in a metal standing seam, but uh, I guess it really wouldn't be that much. All right. Uh, let's see here. Get back to work. Okay. Do you sell any bamboo products at your store? Um, bamboo flooring. I mean, I've gotten that in before. All uh, right. I love the shitty cars. You know, I read an article a long time ago that says if you want to be rich, you drive a POS. And I thought about that, you know, how many people, because I thought, man, I should go out and just get a new car so I can have something nice to drive around. You know, this thing runs great. I mean, but it is like, it's a crappy car. It's a POS. But anyway, I was reading this article talking about if you really want to be rich, you got to drive a, you got to drive a POS because, you know, you think about it, like I paid $500 for this car. I I don't know, like, I mean, I put tires on it, that's about it, I, I put tires on it, changed the oil, and, I mean, it's, like, nothing to insure it, I don't know, it's, like, all the money that I save in this, like, I mean, I just think about every year that I save driving this car is just that much nicer of a car I can drive when I do want to, and I think about it, it's like, how often do I really want to drive a nice car? Like most of the time I'm just driving this car to work. You know, I'm just, it's just transportation for me. So really do I want a nice car? Like I would love to be driving around in that big, beautiful Camaro, right? But like, how often do I really want to drive it for like 10 minutes, maybe twice a week? You know, that's the only time I really want to drive it is just like a few times. It's not like something that I have like this status symbol that I'm expecting people to see me in. I mean, there's a, there's a hundred thousand of you have already seen me in a damn Corolla. So it's not like, you know, it's not like you're expecting me to be in a Camaro or anything like that. So I hold no status idea, you know, about what it is that I should be driving, but you know, it would be nice to have a new car, but anyway, um, you know, I think about it, what would you rather have, $2 million or a nice car, you know? So I figure I'll get a nice car when I have $2 million. And so I guess that's when you'll know when I have $2 million is when I'm driving a nice car. Hey, somebody sent me a super chat. Cool, where is it? 
and there it is thank you so much nate for the two dollars uh are you familiar with worm board and floor radiant heat well i am familiar with some floor radiant heat systems but um not necessarily familiar with warm warm board i think i said worm but warm board uh floor for radiant heat I'm, i'll look that one up i'm not familiar with that one um what is that not not who's allowed is that what it says no oh no kooks good lord i'm such a terrible reader no kooks allowed 4.99 for the super chat thank you so much thank for the answer my dad was an estimator for lath and plaster company leads in nonsense environmental laws would drive him crazy in california yeah um i hear they can get quite quite intense the uh the environmental laws can local enterprise broadcasting thank you a good compromise a really nice motorcycle cheap to operate fun and fast yeah i i love i like the idea of a motorcycle um i rode a little bit when i was younger like in my teenage years but i do not have enough experience on a motorcycle to to feel comfortable taking highway 30 on a regular basis because it is a death trap of a highway in fact i'm nervous about driving it in this little car I mean, anybody who's familiar with the stretch of road, you know, leading into Astoria on Highway 30, but it is like there is so many deaths on this on this little stretch, and uh, you know, people just don't pay enough attention to to you know people who are riding bikes, and you know, that's I mean, that's just a sad case of it. But uh, I don't think I would ever really use it as a regular commuter. It would be fun to have a bike just for fun, but then again, you know, I would just want it for you know 10 minutes a couple of times a week. Well, probably longer than that if you wanted to go for a ride. But you know what I'm saying. It's just like, you know. Anyway. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. UE, love your channel and really enjoyed your YouTube award opening that you did with your family. Well done. Thanks. Yeah, the boys really enjoyed it too. It was a lot of fun uh, doing that video. It was actually Freddy who was most excited about it. He was just like dad dad you know it's a hundred thousand you get your you get your award and i'm like okay well i don't i don't know even how to do it he's like well let's figure it out so he was like he was pumped he was just like hey, i need to put the shield up there also so he was like more pumped about it than uh than i think i was but yeah the boys are so cool they are so laid back i mean when it comes to the channel it's funny because Freddie is, he's really, both of them are big into YouTube. I mean, I guess it's because they see, you know, dad up on YouTube, but they don't really talk about like me being like a YouTube tuber, like to their, to anybody. Like when they are talking about their channels or talking about their favorite YouTubers and stuff like that, my name never comes up. I mean, I've watched them like, because Freddie is so interactive. Like when we went to the mall yesterday, he is just interacting with anybody. If he sees a dog, he's just immediately going over to to pet a dog. You know, ask the owners if he can pet him. But he uh, he communicates with adults quite well. And it's funny when he talks about like some of his favorite things. He never brings up like my channel. Neither does Mac. Mac never brings it up either. So the boys are like, I don't know if they're just just used to it just like so accustomed to to just me having this channel that is no big deal to them but uh it's funny it's like like it's almost like nobody else nobody around knows like you know it's it's crazy i have like friends who come up to me like you know even recently it's like dude i just caught your youtube channel man it's amazing i can't believe how many youtube subscribers you have yeah. anyway uh let's talk about economics who is this this is chris Christine Smith, thank you for the five dollars. A cheap old car is great, but a death trap in terms of crash rating. Wouldn't risk in it with my family. Google it, see it for yourself. I know, and that's the reason why I even brought it up is because I have close dear friends who died not too long ago on highway, you know, just outside of town in a little tiny car, and it was devastating to to have it happen. It was a really sad story. And, um, you know, I think about that stuff a lot because in growing up around here, anybody who has seen, you know, who's lived anywhere around here for any length of time knows that there is so many accidents out there. It's just, 
It's all the time. Like, all the time. Uh, uh, let's see here. Wars have been won by Toyota Helix. Space program advancement. Let's see here. Is there any other questions? Uh, bikes are great for cities with narrow streets like Istanbul. Love the hat. Yeah, thanks. My wife actually made me this hat back when Ron Paul was running for president. I wore this hat a long time. I'd rather get rear-ended in an old car than a new one. I don't want to get rear-ended at all. Do you think the Fed will be abolished with the next 10 years due to all their policy mistakes? I drive a POS and I'm proud not to have that debt. Yeah, I'm happy not to have the debt too. No, I don't think the Federal Reserve is going to be abolished in the next 10 years. I don't, in fact, I don't think the Federal Reserve is going to get abolished at all. Um, you know, the, the powers that be have such good control with it that it would be, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that it would take, it would take people to truly understand what the federal reserve is and then choosing not to participate in that system, like in any way. Now, if that could happen, then yeah, maybe we would, we would see something take place, but, um, no, most people just... I mean, they could really care less. Like the people who are watching here on this channel and stuff, like we understand it. And we would think like, you know, if anybody understood it, like the, to the level that we do, even just a little bit of a level, I mean, just to even understand that the federal reserve is just not part of the government, you know, that part alone is just like, it's just like people just have a hard time even grasping that part, you know? And so, you know, until that kind of day happens, I just see that they really just, they have, they have it, they have a control over it, you know? Uh, uh, do you think India should be our ally because they are playing double game here? You know, I, I, it, you know, whether it's ally or enemies or any anything like that, like to me, like it's it's so it, you know, it really shouldn't be like a game of them and us. There really shouldn't be you know, enemies and stuff. There should be just states that, you know, understand production and growth and and how to, you know, take advantage of their, you know, natural resources in a way that doesn't destroy the, you know, the world. I mean, that kind of thing should happen. But whether or not, like, particular countries should be on this side or that side or whether we should have a good or bad or whatever, I mean, that's not... I mean, obviously, that's always going to take place because that's the way it always has been. But, I, I mean, that's not for me to decide, like, you know, what I think should be. It's just more of, like, the observation of what is that you should be doing. It's just, like, it's not it's not up to me to decide, like, you know, whether we should have a Democratic or Republican administration. I mean, I don't, it's, like, looking at it from an economics point of view, it's not, it's not up to me to decide or even think about which one is better or worse. It's more of what are the cause and effects from the situation that we are in and what position should I be in because of that that's more that's why it's like to me voting it doesn't really matter anymore because like it I, it doesn't I, I can care less when you vote for Republicans or Democrats when neither one of these people have any kind of belief system that I would think that I would be approving of I mean for one of them like following the Constitution would be a nice start right I mean just staying within the confines of the Constitution I think would be a great start for our administrations to start doing and because we have a tendency to de deteriorate the Constitution and not head back towards it, I really just care less about continuing on with this left-right paradigm that we seem to be following. It's not, it's not good, you know, I mean, it's just like whatever, you know, at that point, it's just like, I'm just going to capitalize on whatever it is that, you know, everybody else decides is the better system that seems to be. Uh... Uh, audit the Fed will end the Fed. Yeah, if you could get, if you could audit the Fed, I think that would be a fun, fun thing to try and do. Um, you know, my man George Gammon was trying to get that to happen. He was trying to, like, he was trying to pull some legal stuff on him. I don't know how far it ever really got, though. Uh, Yui, how do you think the interest rates will go before the Fed's pivots? How, f how far? How high? Oh, how high do I think? Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I would think that the Federal Reserve would love to get the interest rates as close to 5% as they could. 
that would be a huge that would be like i i think that would be a far stretch to to achieve like i don't think the federal reserve could actually achieve five percent on the fed funds level um the the economic impact that that would have would be like quite dramatic um i i would feel that they would want to get to around five percent so they could have that that amu oh, man i cannot talk that ammo <laughs> i can't say it that ammo to to drop uh to drop interest rates again so anything above like you know, this two and a half percent, three is going to be really impactful on an economy that is already starting to show signs of weakness. Even though you're going to find lots of people out there saying, oh, no, there's this like this great still look at the numbers. The numbers are awesome. But you can just see it already. Like, you know, the consumer is getting hurt. The you know, the the rich are stepping down into to the generic products. The you know, the the talk of layoffs is increasing there's it's it's obviously that there's there's a change that has taken place that we are going to be going into some some harder times and so as you watch the federal reserve continue to lift interest rates because it's pretty much like i mean for them to say that they are no longer using the forward guidance that's like i i i disagree with that i mean everything that you have heard since they said that is them saying how they're going to lift interest rates how it's up how it's you know, it, it's of their thoughts. Like they don't, they don't have any kind of decision that they're going to be raising interest rates, but it's of their like idea that they should continue to, but they're going to be data dependent on that, on that whole thing. Well, that's job owning that right there has the markets believing that the interest rates are going to continue to rise. And it's exactly what we saw happen. I mean, the 10 years, like I didn't check it to, you know, Friday. I mean, it was like a 2.9 last time I looked at it. So I don't know if it actually got to, to three, but anyway, the 10 year treasury yield is rising. And if you watch the 10 year, you're going to watch all the rest of the interest rates continue to rise as well. And that's mortgages and car loans and everything else. So if the 10 year rises, all the rest of the interest rates will continue to rise. And although they really haven't done a whole lot more than what they said that they were going to do, other than say that they were going to continue to raise interest rates, or at least they're of the belief that they should. And the markets behaved as if they were going to do that because that's what's happening. I mean, what is it? The dollar index is at like what? 108 or something like that. You know how many people told me that the dollar was never going to rise again. It was never going to strengthen and that interest rates were never going to rise. I mean, I it's for every action, you're going to find an equal and opposite reaction. And that's what we're going to find right now. I mean, I know inflation is like tearing people up, but the dollar strengthening around the world is killing nations and corporations. I mean, it is doing some serious damage. And that's really where, like, the king dollar rules the world. I mean, here in the United States, that's really the only thing we focus in on. But the Federal Reserve has a, has two things going on. They have the world reserve currency, and then they have the monetary policies of the United States. And it's the same thing. I mean, it's like they have two things that they're dealing with, but we only care about the monetary policy. We don't really seem to care about what it is as a, you know, world reserve currency and what impact it has to have the world demand federal reserve liabilities in order to conduct business. I mean, it's a big deal. Well, I'm really rambling. Maybe I don't need to drink this coffee. Uh, um, I can't get an answer from anyone. If China is selling U.S. bonds, wouldn't they be taking USD, which would raise the value of... Yeah, until it does. Yeah, that's exactly... Okay, wouldn't that be... Wouldn't they be taking USD, which would raise the value of USD until it doesn't? Yeah, and I did a video on that not too long ago where we were talking about that very thing. Like, a lot of people look at China or anybody else when they start dumping U.S. treasuries, right? When they're, when they're dumping these U.S. treasuries, a lot of people are saying, hey, this is them getting out of, you know, out of the dollar. I, I don't feel that way. And to me they are getting into the dollar that's what they're trying to do and there's no better way to get into the dollar than to sell u.s treasuries and that's how you get a hold of cash i mean you think about like you know you think about all the dollar denominated debt that exists in the world and as the demand for dollars to pay that debt increases that's the demand for the federal reserve liabilities we don't know how big 
that debt is. Like how big this shadow currency system, this world shadow currency system really is. Because these debts that are due, like a lot of times they are, I mean, in fact, the majority of the time, they have nothing to do with the United States, doesn't have anything to do with their corporations or government, nothing. Right? It's just these two entities outside of the United States who have decided to do a deal in U.S. dollars. And that contract gets used as if it's U.S. dollars. And that starts adding to the shadow currency system that's in the world. Well, if those debts start to become due and people are not willing to take out any more debt or too nervous about taking out debt because it's too expensive as far as you know being able to acquire these dollars well then there's not enough dollars to go around to pay off all these debts and then the demand for it really starts to increase and that's where the federal reserve has no idea on how much currency they should really have out there you know sometimes i wonder it was just like if it can get really bad if the demand for like if everybody wanted to get out of that dollar denominated debt it makes me wonder how much dollars really exist out there to pay off all that debt and if the federal reserve could even print at a pace that's fast enough to pay all that off i mean it's just like i doubt it and you know what kind of damage would come from that it's better to just let these things default on it you know and that's what's happening i mean you're seeing you know sovereign nations that's why i think there's going to be a sovereign and corporate debt crisis you know a sovereign debt crisis all right uh let's see here do you think Fed will let the rate stay high for like four or five percent for a long time to fight inflation despite the national debt skyrocketing? However, I think the government wants to inflate the debt away. Or do YCC? What's YCC? What am I missing that? Um, I, I mean, as far as like the Federal Reserve keeping the interest rates elevated for an extended period of time i do see them doing that now what i found interesting is like they've used the statement to until they have achieved their two percent inflation for a substantial amount of time like they don't want to just get to two percent they want to be at two percent for a while before they start dropping interest rates See, this is where my concern is that everybody is missing what it is that the Federal Reserve is attempting to do. Because the Federal Reserve said a while ago that they are going for a 2% average, not a 2% target. And as far as I can tell, there's never been a time where that inflation has stayed anywhere. Like, it always seems to be constantly moving. So you'll never be at a 2% for any substantial length of time. You'll either be above it or below it, right? I mean, but never like right at it, never. And so when they say that, when they say they want to be at 2% for a substantial amount of time, that to me is them saying that they want to get to that 2% average inflation rate, right? Once they hit 2% average, then that's when they'll start dropping the inflation or it starts dropping the interest rates once they get to the 2% average inflation. But that seems to be something that nobody talks about, not even the Federal Reserve to say, OK, well, our 2 percent average right now is whatever. They just talk about this 2 percent or they just talk about this inflation target. So it makes it very difficult to understand, like what it is that the Federal Reserve is actually shooting for, because everybody says they're way overshooting it and they're not right reacting or they reacted too late or whatever. And I'm thinking, yeah, to that 2 percent target, but not to a 2 percent average. Like to me, the two percent average is something that is some that is very different, and the strategy for that would be far different as well, which would mean that you would keep interest rates elevated for an extended period of time to make up for the fact that you've had inflation running under the two percent target for however many years, ten years. So now, how long does it have to run above that in order to come up with a two percent average? And then, how long does it have to stay at that two percent average before you'll drop the interest rates back down to what would be? normal i don't even know what normal is anymore because they don't do things like in a way that they had before like this two percent average inflation has completely changed the way that they do their strategy yeah hey what's happening lord humongous what do you have to say the fed is always behind the curve it was designed that way yeah it really is i mean well they're data dependent on everything it's as if they're driving a car that's going this way but they're looking in the rearview mirror to make their decisions i mean it's like it's the strangest concept when you think about it but i mean what else do you have i mean you have to have the data to look at in order to make decisions from it but you know anybody who's like looking at future trends can see things much differently you know and, and 
try to be more predictive than what the Federal Reserve is going to do as far as being data dependent, you know. All right, UE, have you read? Oh, you, man, you keep bringing this guy up all the time, huh? Zillions. I haven't. I, I, in fact, I don't read books much. What is it, Peter? How do you say his name? Zihan's latest book. He is very interesting perspective with the respect to China's collapse. All right, you got fuzzy dice showing ten. Um, I'm thinking big box retailers are going to unload things like refrigerators, washing machines, etc. Next year, they'll be a lot more scarce. Well, and that's the... <clears throat> and see, that's where I think, like, the major... That's when I think there's going to be a real shortage taking place. Like, we had a shortage where we had issues getting stuff distributed through the supply chain. But that's not really a shortage. It's like a backlog. It's like, you know... Like, you just can't get it from here to there, but it still exists, right? A real shortage is when it just doesn't exist at all. See, we had shortages because of this, like, backing up of inventory sitting up on, you know, out on all the container ships. But now, as that stuff starts to flow through the system and people really don't want it anymore because they overordered and all this stuff came in, right? Because we've already talked about the bullwhip effect, right? And, you know, this over-manufacturing of all these goods to try and fill into what appeared to be an overwhelming consumer demand, which actually just turned out to be allocations and over-ordering and stuff like that, you know, damn panic buying and stuff. But now I think about that because once that inventory starts coming into the system, then the orders start, stop going, right? So you have this lack of orders going to the manufacturers and that lack of orders going to the manufacturer is going to be damaging because now you have lack of manufacturing that is actually taking place and now once all this inventory flows through the system, there's not going to be, there's going to be like a gap in production taking place where there's not going to be inventory to fill in for all the overstock that's taking place right now. Do you guys kind of see what I'm getting at? And so there's going to be a time where there's going to be a manufacturing boost, right? Right after this major shortage starts to take place. It makes me wonder if that's when the, like the real AI technology and all the, you know, this big movement that seems to be taking place, this great reset or whatever, does it does it happen then when the great when the real great shortages seem to take place from the lack of manufacturing that is occurring now due to the fact that there's a lack of orders because of the overabundance of inventory that is now happening? Man, did I get that right? <laughs> Man, I'm a little hyper this morning. I don't know. Maybe I've already had too much coffee. Maybe that's my problem. Eating bugs and living in the pots. I don't know, man. Lordy Mongus, I, I come from like an area that is just abundant in food. Like, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe bugs dipped in chocolate would be good. Why are you guys all knocking it? You know? I mean, you don't know. All right. I'm glad you got 100,000 subs. I enjoyed the video of the unboxing. Thank you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. That, um, you know, it's quite the achievement getting getting to that hundred thousand subscriber mark i mean you know when i started this channel i never thought in a million years that i would ever ever get here and you know being able to you know to come out and share my thoughts and you know to be rewarded in such ways with it you know it's um it's really changed my life and done done an amazing thing for my family because uh i was not doing well there five years ago but yeah it's quite quite the difference all right, human digestion system cannot handle chitin or bugs. Oh, well, that's too bad. Um, all right, congratulations, Brother Simon, on the 100,000. Thank you, Lord Humongous. I really appreciate that. You earned it. E-U-L-U-E, -E, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Truth Talks. I do appreciate that. U.S. deflation, the world deflation, equals world deflation. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it doesn't even take like, it doesn't even take much deflation. It's just the idea that there would be deflation or the idea that the Federal Reserve is going to be tightening up the money supply. That's enough to send ripples throughout the world. I mean, you think about the credible threat that that does to everybody who is like, you know, out there in U.S. dollar debt and can't get it. Yeah. Can't get the dollar anyway. Uh, let's see here. Make the WEF eat bugs. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. 
what was big money knowing okay that was big money knowing housing is going to crash and bbby won't make it i shorted the hell out of it from 18 to 25 We eat bugs and we will be happy. Isn't red dye come from bugs? Don't isn't that the case? I thought that's where like red dye came from was like some bug. Uh, ew, here I'm going back a little ways. Ew, you, hey, you do you think the jobs are on the rise because people having to take a second job to afford what they need? Don't think the numbers reflect the true numbers. Um, as far as people, like, I think, honestly, I think there's so many ways to make money now that the need for a second job, like, you don't really need a second job when there's so many other ways to side hustle work. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's like, I see it every day, like, you know, from people doing DoorDash to doing content videos to, you know, to just you know buying and selling stuff like you know just flipping things on like craigslist and things i mean stuff where you don't necessarily have to like show up at a particular location in order to make money there are so many ways to 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 try and earn a few dollars that that uh that i just don't see where like you know people need to take a second job um but i do see where people are going to end up needing to fill these jobs in oh hey cool and super chat um, I do see where people are going to need to fill these jobs in as the layoffs really start to kick in. But I, I kind of called this a while ago. Like, really what I see happening with the jobs market is that we saw a we saw a huge um, increase in the amount of debt that, cor that corporations, companies were taking during the pandemic. Because the interest rates were so low, they were, like, gorging on this incredibly cheap debt. And really, there was no place for investors to go. Like, if you're looking for a fixed income investment and you are looking at the U.S. Treasuries as the guaranteed return and the interest rates were sitting, like, really low, you're like, well, there's no return on investment when you buy a U.S. Treasury. The only thing you're going to actually hope for is that interest rates will continue to go down into the future and you'll be able to sell that asset for, for a higher price. So fixed income investors, people who are actually looking for a return on their income, had to go and seek it out in riskier investments and they found it in the corporate debt and then when the federal reserve came out with that special purpose vehicle and got everybody all jazzed up on the corporate debt saying that they were going to be buying corporate debt and so people tried to front run them it just drove ever increasing amounts of investment into those corporations and just loaned them like loads and loads of money on a very cheap price you know as far as the yields go and now these corporations are sitting on that debt and they have to either roll it over or be able to pay it. And when you have a consumer who is getting hurt by the higher inflation that has taken place, then what are those corporations going to do? Like, you know, you have to pay your debt or so you either have to roll that debt over into new debt or you need to start selling off or layoffs or doing something, you know, like a lot of these corporations even bought their own stock back with this. So they're going to have to start selling stock or doing something like that. This is where I feel like it can start causing a problem where it just, you know, just keeps, you know, snowballing out of control. All right. Thank you very much, Marty Gold, for the $10. I really appreciate that. A computer science grad and business owner, it is difficult for me to have such pessimistic view of the next one to two decades. Look into Peter Diamond Diamonds? Or David Sinclair were headed for abundance. Oh no, I agree with that. I mean, I think the greatest time in our lives are certainly coming when it comes to this technology. I mean, people are scared of like a vehicle that'll drive them around, like you know, self-driving cars. I love that idea. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like driving a car, but I mean, to think about it, just get in a vehicle and just like have it take you wherever you want to go. I mean, how cool, how cool is that? I mean, that's like super awesome. And then like just all the conveniences of life. I mean, you think about it. Even Cantillon was saying like. Wealth is, is defined by three things, food, conveniences, and pleasures of life, right? So if you have 
robots that can make as much food as possible. Like, right, there's no like shortage of food because you got as many robots as you want that can produce as much food. Scary as much as that is and within its own, but let's just like take the scary part out of it and just say that that's happened, right? So already now you got wealth for everybody, right? Because wealth is food, conveniences, pleasures of life. Well, if you have robots that can make food, then that's conveniences that allows you to do whatever you want because you're not spending all your time trying to acquire food. So really what you need is a place to live. That's really difficult when you think about it because like having a house for everybody is really hard, especially when you don't have family formations taking place. But I guess everybody could live in like a pod or something like that. So if you can have like a little tiny office space, like, I mean, I was watching people in like China or something like they live in like these internet cafes where they like literally like sleep in a tiny little cubicle where you can mess around on your computer. It was like, scary to think about, but really this is how people live. So you can have apartments that are just super tiny. You don't need family formation type apartments. And so you think about it, food, conveniences, and then pleasures of life. Well, you know, if you don't have to work for anything, then you can just go off and pursue all the pleasures you want. Think about how wealthy that is to have, you know, even though you have like all the like scary, like stuff that could come down like this surveillance and the restrictions and you know how it is that people would never be able to like, you know, fend for themselves or provide for themselves or do anything like that. But, you know, really, most people don't want to do that anyhow. So, yay, right? Think about how fun that is to be all wealthy. Everybody gets to be wealthy. <laughs> I got a weird view of the future, don't I? All right. Hey, Simon, I must congratulate you again on the 100,000 subs. Silver YouTube plaque. Now go for the gold. Yeah, thanks, guys. Well, you know, I mean, the... The best way, because I never ask you guys, except for like videos like these, these live streams, I never ask you guys to like or subscribe to my videos. I never ask for a like because I figured that if you truly like the video, then you would hit the like button and I would know that I was doing a good job. So I never ask for people to like the videos unless they truly like them. And, and I never ask for it during the videos. And I never ask for a subscription ever. I thanked people for subscribing to the channel, but I've never asked for subscriptions because again, I feel that if you truly wanted to be part of this channel, be part of the the conversation in the comments, then you would want to come back and subscribing to the channel is the easiest way to, to come back to the channel for other videos. And so to me, it's built a much stronger, um, I don't know, like more resilient viewer uh, you know to as far as viewers i mean all of you guys some of you have been here for four or five <laughs> for since what november of 2017 i mean there's some of you who have been here the entire time who have really seen the growth of this channel and the transitions that have that i've made through through it and some of the things that i've accomplished from it too i mean things that i never would have expected to to have come so thank you very much for for helping me get here but um if you really want to help the channel grow tell your friends about it that's the easiest way word of mouth everybody like if everybody went out there who is subscribed to the channel got you know their cousin or you know their sister or you know their neighbor down the street or somebody to subscribe to the channel we could grow the channel really fast it's really word of mouth that does it i mean the algorithm that youtube does it goes out there and finds the audience so it finds the group that wants to be involved in these videos that's what's good about YouTube, but there's no better form of like trying to do a sale or advertising or anything else than through word of mouth. It is by far the best. I mean, I've learned that through networking here in my, my local community because I know so many people, if there's something out there that I want or that I'm looking for, I start putting the word out there that I'm, that I'm after it. And it's just a matter of time before somebody picks up on that thing and then it comes back to me. Um, I was hoping that was what was going to, jeez whiz, I was hoping that was going to be the case during the time when I was having to find a place to rent and I couldn't find a place to rent. I thought, no way can I know this many people in this town and not find a place to rent, but that seemed to be the case. There was literally no place to rent in Astoria last year. So anyway, wish I found you sooner. Always glad to be here. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad everybody's here. And, uh, you know, the, the more we talk about this stuff, the more we bring it up, the more, you know, conversations that we have, it's just like, it's just more information that we get to understand. And it's not like, 
it's not like everybody's going to be making the same decision, right? Like, you know, what you do with your money and what I'm going to do with mine is going to be far different. Like, I mean, I'm, you know, 46 years old and just barely got out of debt, just figuring out how it is that I'm going to try and like, you know, pay for a house and figure out how to put things in this house. Like I got old furniture and old crap from like, you know, back in the day, like I didn't do things right my entire life. I did things really wrong and it was really close to being in the gutter at one point. So, you know, my life is not even close to what it was just a few years ago. And the decisions I have to make are much different than the decisions that most people and who, you know, who are, well, I wouldn't say who are 46 because everybody's going to be different in their decisions. But, you know, somebody who has like, you know, a regular job, who's worked their entire life, you know, you would think that you would have saved something for your future. And I didn't save nothing. <laughs> you know? uh, how are you doing, sir? Glad to see online. Are you always streaming live on Sundays? No, I just kind of stream whenever I get around to it. Just kind of fun. Um, I mean, I probably should set up like a regular time. That way there would be more people who would come to it. But I think it's kind of a fun surprise to just, you know, to just all of a sudden pop on and just do a live stream out of nowhere. All right. Uh, Marty Gold with the $5. Peter Diamonds. Am I saying that right? Diamond Diamonds <laughs> has great book or audio books. That's what I need is audio. The future faster than you think. It's excellent. Highly recommended. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we'll have to check that one out. I got a list of books that I really need to go through. You guys have sent me so many awesome books that I would just love to. I wish I could just blast through books. Like, you know, I've seen like my. You know, I've seen people who can just like really read books and like. Uh, you know, like to be able to like. You know, just to read something and re be able to recall it from like you know years ago or whatever, and to be able to say, "Hey, it was in this book," or that would be like, to me, it would be so awesome. Like to me, most of the information that I have has come from, you know, people's lectures or from Federal Reserve speeches or their documents or news articles. I get a lot out of the news articles, trying to keep up on, you know, current affairs and stuff like that. So. I, it would be nice to have some some like books to like to reference back to. All right. Um, I just joined the live, but you should check out flight passenger data since the pandemic, specifically New York, Seattle, San Francisco. Air traffic dropped off a cliff. So basically, as I always say to the precious metals community, you're using crap dollars to buy it. I'm not touching that crap with a 10-foot pole. It's worthless by association. Are you talking about precious metals? No, it's not worthless. It's a very, very valuable thing. <laughs> the West Coast is toast. <laughs> Last question, what do you think of white population becoming minority in 2047 do you find it an issue um i don't think about stuff like that um do you think the BRICS country russia china india will try to make a new reserve currency and try to replace the usd president zai is going to saudi arabia soon okay um sure I mean, I think they would love to try and do something like that. The only problem is, is you got to think like, what is it that we have for a world reserve currency is we have the United States dollar. And there's a couple of things that you really need to have in order to be the world reserve currency. And this is something that I've brought up many times. And this is why I'm saying that there's no replacement for the dollar at this point. Now, if you want to have the world reserve currency, you're going to have to have one of two things. Well, no, you have to have two of two things, I should say, is you have to have a debt market that is big enough that you can provide a safe and liquid asset like the US treasuries to the world. So that means you have to go into debt unlike any other nation would ever be willing to do. And then on top of that, you have to take and provide the world with the dollars. That means you have to go into deficit spending. And you not not only deficit spending, you have to go into deficit trade. 
So you're spending more money outside of the nation than you are spending within the nation. That way you can get your dollars out of the United States. And so if you're willing to have a trade deficit as big as the United States and to have a debt market as big as the United States, then you could probably provide the world with a world reserve currency. But that is not even remotely close to what anybody has even come close to even trying to do. Like they are setting up different trades they're involved in that like it's outside of the united states dollar but it is such such a small amount that it doesn't even compete will it at some point sure will it grow yeah i mean i guess it could i mean it's only a matter of time right there's less people using the dollar more people using this you know other systems that are out there and will it eventually you know be that currency that is the world choosing i mean who knows i i mean that's just time will tell on all that but as of right now, there's nothing even remotely close to touching the dollar. The dollar is it. All right. Uh, we will never see a stock market crash thanks to Circuit Breaker. Now that Bitcoin trades in those markets, we will see 35% days. Uh, I don't know, maybe. I mean, I don't, I don't get excited about Bitcoin. It, the stuff is just way too volatile. I like dollar cost average into Bitcoin. Fifty dollars a week is what I had been doing. I haven't done a whole lot right now because I just been getting into cash. I think cash is the better position to be in for at least the time being. But as far as like Bitcoin and when it starts to rally and run up and people start talking about hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin, a million dollar Bitcoin and stuff, I I don't really listen to the hype. I just don't get that excited about it. Um, there was a time when I did, but I I don't anymore. Uh, uh, they have strangled airports in the UK and even starting to plan to close some permanently. Yeah. Seems like they're cutting off the traffic, huh? We will never see a stock market crash thanks to Circo. We already had that one. Is there anybody else who has any other questions? Let's move up here a little bit. Uh, how many are up in here? 389 of you, 234 likes. Uh, give me all your worthless dollars. Yeah, that's funny, huh? No precious... Okay, here's Durango. He hates precious metals. No precious metals are crap. A farmer with any sense is not killing a 200-pound cow so a couple of people with shiny metal can buy 10 to $20 worth of beef. That's not how it's ever worked. So what will the farmer take if everybody has nothing? Like if they don't have any silver and they don't have anything and this farmer has like 200 cows that he's been raising up there looking to make his fortunes off of it and there is no money and he doesn't want silver, what does he want? I mean, there's only so many tools, there's only so many skills that he could use from somebody, so he has 200 cows, what is he going to do? I mean, I have to ask that, Durango, because you've brought that up many times, you know, that, you know, farmers or whatever aren't going to accept shiny tokens and I can believe it. I mean, if you're starving and you're in the middle of nowhere and all you have is gold and there's some guy sitting there telling you, no, I don't want gold. You give him up your entire stash if you're going to die because you didn't have food. I mean, it's actually, that's what one of the, uh, one of the viewers had talked about what happened to him in, um, Cuba. His family had saved up a bunch of gold in case of bad times. And all of a sudden there was like, you know, starvation happening and food was super expensive. They gave up that gold right away because everybody was hungry. Uh, will you guys stop asking questions now? Do, do, do. Let's see here. What most people in the precious metals community... Oh, no, I think we already talked that one, didn't we? Getting close to wiring the house, Paul and Raymond. Oh, hey, right on. The Silver Possum, that's right. We met over at uh, over at the coffee shop a while back when I was doing those meet and greets. I should do those more often. Nobody has any more questions, either that or the questions are just stopped. Uh, fat tanks of gasoline for the humongous. I love the smell of diesel in the morning. Smells like victory. 
Yeah, Lord Humongous. I always think about that when I fire up the trucks when I'm moving them out. It's like I used to drive the trucks around quite a bit doing deliveries. Driving machinery is fun, you know, especially like forklifts when you get really good at it. Forklifts are a fun machine to operate. I can't wait for you video about how the national debt is not an obligation. Go for it. And how 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 is how am I supposed to do a video about that being I don't know. I guess everybody is like quit asking questions, huh? Or did I turn off the comments or something? So anyway, what else can we uh talk about here? You know, I thought the uh, the article coming out of China was pretty interesting with the uh, with the rich selling off those luxury items. This is something that I think is really going to start taking place here in the United States soon. I mean, so many people went off and bought like expensive cars and you know just went crazy with that stimulus package. And then when we start going into hard times, when you start getting into you know times where it's like expensive for food, expensive to travel, you know, because of gasoline or something like that. You start selling off those expensive items quite quickly, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see something like that happening here. What's going on with the comment section? Did I just turn it off or something? All chats are visible, right? All right. Oh, here we go. How is the house life going in Oregon? Uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier. It's really nice. I'm enjoying living there. It's a lot of fun. All right. Uh, let's see here. In a true economics collapse, the only thing you wish you have are bullets for your guns because that's the only thing people will respond or respect is brute force. Um, well, I certainly don't disagree with that. Like, you should definitely be able to uh, defend yourself. And, you know, unfortunately, firearms are by far the best way to defend yourselves. I mean, that's one of the reasons why you were given the right to bear them, you know, here in the United... And you weren't given that right, why you have the right to bear arms here in the United States. You know, it's just simply so you can protect yourself because there's nobody else who can do it for you except for you. And so you should have the ultimate way of protecting yourself. And that's with firearms. I mean, there's really nothing else out there that quite does it the same way. Uh, you have to also... Oh, here's Durango's response, I think. You also have to understand that many farmers, ranchers have already made preparations to deal with this look at the coast cost of diesel fuel when it goes up every general lesson what they have they generally lessen what they have oh i see all right moving on here um will digital be the new world reserve currency well i think so at some point we're going to end up falling into What's going to be a digital world reserve currency now i don't know if that's going to be like the fed now doing it with like the federal reserve being the world reserve currency or the bank for the world reserve currency to me i think it's probably going to end up being much more on the world banking scale where like something like the sdr becomes the world reserve currency but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be the one that all nations use around the world i mean it could be anything out there that they end up using and I mean, you think about, like, how many different ways of doing, like, layering systems where you can have, you know, like, see, that's where a lot of people, like, there's so much to talk about when it comes to, like, the digital currencies out there. But I do feel that at some point they will take cash out of the system completely. We will be on 100% digital basis. And that's, it's scary to think about, but it's unfortunate that's just the way it's going to like it's headed towards um how long that takes that's going to be another question because it could take a lot longer than people think but then again it could happen a lot faster too than anybody would ever have expected um you know because already you think about it, it's like there is so much like digital use already when people use debit cards for just about all their purchases cash is very rare out there when you think about like the average purchases out there like most of them are probably done on debit card or through computer transactions of some sort because a lot of purchases are done online now. So anyway, um, 
kind of lost track of what I was saying there. But uh, I guess as far as a world reserve currency goes, I could see where like an SDR type of world reserve currency where they have like a basket of, de of different central bank digital currencies that create a currency that like nations could use between each other. But then again, it could be, you know, who knows? We could have like hundreds of currencies that get used for global transactions. I mean, there's no reason why they couldn't. So it's it's... I mean, I don't think there's any necessarily like any rule to the game at this point because really the the rules are being written now. All right, have you read about the Moscow World Standard? There is not a whole lot of information out there besides the Zero Hedge articles. I haven't. Um, I mean, I've heard about like you know Russia adding gold to their to their currency to try and like do a gold standard of a sort um you know there was talk of that here in the united states as well i mean not necessarily within congress talking about doing it but that there is concepts out there of how it would be done um you know being able to partially back some of the treasuries with gold like ounces of gold and it doesn't necessarily mean that they would actually be like delivered in gold but that they would pay out in whatever the equivalent of gold would be at the time. So, I don't know, there is kind of ways of, of integrating a gold standard into the system. And if you really, if you had a digital currency system, it would be a whole lot easier because then you could actually have warehouses that are audited that do know exactly how much gold is and silver is sitting on the shelves and then you can back it with digital tokens and then actually be operating even though with you're using like digital forms like your phone or a debit card or something what you're spending is like the real deal you're actually spending silver and gold through you know a mediator that has it in a warehouse um, that's third party you have to trust but still that's a pretty neat way of going about it you know, I see a world where you can have multiple currencies. That's that's really what I would like to see is that, you know, you could go to the store and you could spend cash, debit card, cryptocurrencies, gold, silver, whatever. You could just spend it all right there. And because you would be, you know, you'd have to, the, the person that you're working with, like, you know, the store or whatever, I mean, to drop down a silver eagle and say, here, I want to spend this, you know, I mean, the person on the other side may not know what exactly that is. It's not like a dollar that's recognizable. It's silver, which is pretty recognizable if you know what you're looking at. But then again, you don't know if it's like counterfeit or what. So if you had it in a digital form where it was sitting at a bank like that third party, that would kind of eliminate the problems that you would have as far as somebody recognizing whether or not it was actual silver. But that's the type of like world that I see is multiple currencies. Competing currencies would be would be awesome. All right, let's see here. They'll give business to tax break to stop accepting cash until it becomes the norm. Then they'll take the tax break away. Yeah. I mean, I just think they'll just charge a fee to use cash. They'll just make it a complete nuisance. All right, the pandemic shut down the global production. It also affected farming and all kinds of the other commodities. The reason there's inflation is that there just aren't enough goods to be sold right now. Well, I think that's the case with necessities, with a lot of like the food and, and things that you need, energy. But when it comes to like TVs and kitchen appliances, I think there's going to be plenty of that stuff. I think there's going to be an overload of that. In fact, it's already proven itself to be the case. And we're going to find that to continue for a while. And that's really where I feel that the problem is, like I said, this is where I feel the problem is going to start coming in. Because as this overabundance of inventory starts to really manifest itself to be a problem, then the orders going to the manufacturers are going to cease to exist. And then they're going to start shutting down. And then once all the inventory is gone, there won't be any manufacturing to have taken place to fill in that past inventory. And then manufacturing will take off. Like the investment into manufacturing at that point ought to be like really awesome. Like, you know, you should be able to do really well because everybody's going to be in this huge demand of stuff that just doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the bottom. Let's see. Most people would sell an ounce round of gold and think it's worth 50 bucks printed on the face. Um, 
I do kind of wonder how much people really know about gold and silver, like if they really know the values of it. But I just don't think people care. Like, I mean, they the only thing they care about, and I've heard, I hear more people talk about how much they lost in the stock market over the last few months than I hear them talking about how much gold and silver is worth. And this is something that I find interesting because they, like, they talk about how much they lost. They don't really necessarily talk about how much they gained over the last year. And really, you haven't lost anything if you haven't sold. Like, you know, that's like, you know, you've missed out on opportunity, but really, you never lost anything until you actually sell at a loss. So to, for somebody to say like they lost $17,000 in the stock market over the last couple of months, it was just like, no, you missed out on opportunity, but you didn't lose anything, you know? Market crash after the November elections. How much have you looked into ISDA phase six going into effect September 1st? I haven't. Send me, email me some information on that. Uh, let's see here. If they make cash and nuisance, why would you think they would accept multiple currencies? No, I'm, I'm just saying, I, I'm not saying that's what I think is going to happen into the future, the multiple currencies. That's something that I think would be nice to have coming into the future. You're going to have one currency that you're going to use, and they're going to force you to use it, and it's going to be whatever it is that the Fed decides that it's going to be. And it's probably going to be the central bank digital currency, Fed now system, whatever it is that is, or what it looks like. But I don't think that they're going to have multiple systems. Um, it would be nice if they did, and they could. I mean, it's a possibility, but it's not It's not going to happen. Yui, do you think that the debt market is the real problem? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, because it's all about the whole system is based off of debt, right? I mean, there's it's not based off of a commodity system. It's based off of promises to pay and everybody else has promised to pay you for it. So even like the US treasuries, which backs up our currency, you know, right? The Federal Reserve, they hold treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, a little bit of gold and SDR, stuff like that. But it's all based off of promises to pay. And if you ever get to a situation in which that people quit paying, then you have a system that begins to fall apart. So if you had it based on a commodity, system right you know it's based off of gold or something well then you do have booms and bust cycles as the concentration of gold starts getting into a few hands and then it falls into the many again and then it just keeps going through the cycle i mean this is what cantillon talks about regularly you know or happens regularly through the business cycles and through economic booms and busts so having like a commodity-based currency is good but you know having like all this debt-based currency out there it's not good it's i mean not in my opinion because you ever have to have you have to have ever increasing amounts of it in order to continue to pay off the old stuff and so therefore you always have to have a system in which that people need to continually go deeper into debt it's one of the reasons why i think that they push so many kids so a few years back to go into into student loan debt is because they needed somebody to take out a lot of it. You need people to be in debt and to perpetually be in debt and to continually take out ever increasing amounts of it. If it ever came to a point where everybody was starting to pay their debts off and get out of their credit card debts and mortgage debts and car loans and student loans and government debt and everything else out there and they weren't going to hold any more debt and they weren't going to take out any more and there was going to be no more debt in the world, the dollar would cease to exist. I mean, it just wouldn't be there anymore. So the debt is the problem, but it's the debt-based system in which that we have created. And that's really where the problem exists, is that it has a lifespan to it. Eventually, it's going to fail. How do you, how do you deal with that? And that's where I think this whole central bank digital currency is really going to be like their answer to the problem. Is because if you have everybody locked into digital for the first time, you can force people into negative interest rates because they have no way of getting out of it. And if you can force people in the negative interest rates, well, then you can have a system where you can just pretty much go as deep in the negative as you want. How long that system lasts or what that could look like is beyond me. I mean, you think about it, it's like trying to live your life completely 100% in debt, like from the time you're born to the time you die. But then it's not like so much like how much you can save at that point it's how little debt you have is savings like that would be like people say like wow you're saving up for a house right but you're saving up for a house was well, it's like yeah i've diminished my debt to this 
and now I can buy a house, right? Because you're going to be in debt no matter what. It's just how deep in the debt are you going to be forever? Ugh, scary. Hmm. All right. Why work if they're going to tax you and then take away your savings? Yeah. Um, it makes you wonder, right? I mean, it's going to, you know, that there's going to be a problem. When 50% of your income goes to buying food, that's when pretty much every nation begins to just like fall apart and they riot and they, you know, destroy the capitals and stuff like that. Um, not from some like manifested media one like we've had just recently, but from like true, like given up on everything, given up, lost hope. You, it's just like you have lost it all. You have nothing left to lose. You're losing it. That's the type of scenario that comes when you have 50% of your income going to food. So watch out for that. Watch nations, watch nations that do that. And, uh, yeah, you'll see the real pain. What time is it? Hour 15. I'm going to give it like another 15 minutes guys. And I'm going to bail out of here. I got to go and meet up with a friend. If you truly were going to use as a reserve currency something truly valuable and rare, then why not use platinum or uranium or delia as a as opposed to gold and silver? Those metals are far more rare. Well, I I don't necessarily think it's about the rarity, which it is. I think it's about the the rarity then the um, the recognition right people know what gold and silver is like when you have it in their hands they they reckon like you put some platinum in their hand you say that's platinum they'd be like oh, what's platinum like you know they may even be confused about like what what is platinum in life you know but they understand what silver and gold is in life I mean it's in the Bible it's in like in the life it's in you know society everybody knows what that is so yeah, it's not necessarily about the rarity of it. I think it's just about the recognition of it. It's like something that is ingrained in humans for some reason to want and possess and use gold and silver as the form of currency. And, I mean, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be gold and silver. It's just that's the, what has been used for 5,000 years, and there's no reason why it needs to change from that. I mean, really, it's only been... I mean, a short amount of time on the grand scheme of things that gold and silver wasn't used as money. I mean, what, less than, like, it's just like 50, 60 years now. It's not even that long. So, you know, there's no reason why I can't go back to gold and silver. The problem with it is, is that people would have to feel a lot of pain. You know, there's a lot of debt that's due in dollars. And trying to, like, revert back to a gold standard would be very difficult. I would only assume that a lot of people are not going to get paid what they were promised they were going to get paid. And that's the problem when you have a fiat-based currency is that if you want everybody to get paid, then you have to have ever-increasing amounts of debt. Uh, UE, thanks again for taking the time to do what you do. I know I'm not alone in saying that. I really appreciate it. Well, you know, I really appreciate it, too, that you guys are hanging out with me. We got 383, 89 of you, 290 likes. It's awesome that you guys are actually taking the time to hang out with me for the hour, hour and a half that we're out here just to have a discussion, bring up some questions, some topics, read some articles, you know, and uh, figure out what it is that we need to do with our lives, right? Okay, people die and need to have an estate sale family comes in and what are things they take for themselves jewelry metals sell the rest off the junk or yes yeah, sell the rest of the junk yeah i've seen that happen quite a few times you know you, they'll just go in there and take all the the valuable you know possessions and then just like discard the rest not realizing that you know some old casserole dish is like you know has you know it's you know, or something that is like, you know, from 150 years ago or whatever, and not realizing that they're just taking all the jewelry and money and leaving around, you know, ancient old possessions. All right, gold and silver is fundamentally unviable because modern people can't smelt or distribute it properly, and there is so much fake metal out there now. Yeah, but that's, that's, 
I mean, we're reliant on a third party system no matter what anyway, right? No matter what you do, unless you actually have precious metals in hand or you're using like cryptocurrencies where you're actually doing transactions, you know, on the blockchain, then you're reliant upon a third party system no matter what. You're reliant upon a banking system. So that's where that <clears throat> warehousing of metal and then distributing it through a digital token makes so much more sense. Like you could have a, you know, a a gold standard type of currency that is not up to like whether or not it's fake or real or counterfeit or anything. It's going through an app just much like, you know, using you know, Apple Pay or Google Pay or something like that. Or you could even have it on a debit card where the transactions go through a debit card type of purchase. There's no reason why we couldn't have a system set up just like that. The only problem with it is, is that you have to rely on that third party. And that's really where the whole thing starts to break down is that nobody comes in and claims all the gold. I mean, you could, but people don't. So then this little bank, you know, that says, hey, we have all the money that we say we have back here may not have all that money. And they're putting out a lot more money than they have actually sitting in the, in the vaults as far as gold backing it. Now, if you had an on-demand digital ledger system that recognizes the gold that is sitting on the shelf and puts that on a ledger system and puts the token out there and you can't have the token without the gold and the gold wouldn't exist you know, on the shelf, unless there's a token out there to back it or to, to, to show proof of it, you have these two kind of comboed and it's a reliable system, then yeah, that would be badass. I mean, you could totally like have all your money in a safe, secure, precious metal and be able to spend it at will any given time. Like, you know, the price of gold shoots up one day to, you know, some really high price. You go out and buy a, you know, tank of gas with it or something like that. Take advantage of the high price. That would be a really cool system to have and they're already working on these things it's just like you know being able to have that as a viable system for everybody to use or everybody using it that would be a whole different type of uh, economy that we would be operating in you know a handful of people might be able to do it but the majority of people wouldn't do it you know have you seen let me see have you seen the chart of the median house price chart it's plummeting even without July numbers yet to be released. Is this a correction of the post-pandemic price hike or something deep to consider? Well, I'm, I, you're going to find that the prices are probably going to drop and drop dramatically. Now, how long they go down and to what point? You know, you have to think we have had an extremely hot housing market. Prices have way overshot what would be like average or even normal, even normal-ish kind of considering thing. It is way out of normal, right? So you're going to have a correction in prices. To see prices come down and come down dramatically and maybe even overshoot what the average median price would be would not be, un would not be surprising to me. I mean, that would be something that you would consider to take place. How long that goes and then how far the correction goes the opposite direction because once it shoots under that median price you're going to have a pouring in of people i mean people who have been sitting on the sidelines waiting to get a house because there's not been enough homes available are going to rush into an under median average price home but that's not going to last long and then the prices are going to shoot back up once you have the buyers rushing back in if you time that with anything coming from the federal reserve as far as a reversal and their in their interest rate policies or their monetary policies then i could see where like there could be a quick bottoming in the in the markets and you would see like from that point on prices going back up but there's going to be an overcorrection happening so like there's no doubt in my mind that prices probably will not continue to go up and that the actual drop in prices could be quite extreme especially in areas like i live in where it's been a very hot housing market where prices have gone way up and there was very little available. Once the market starts, once the home starts sitting on the market for a longer period of time, then you're going to start seeing the sellers out there, the ones who are eager to sell, they're going to start dropping the prices. But you, I don't know if there's a lot of eager sellers out there as much as there are like greedy sellers who are trying to take advantage of the fact that the housing market may be peaking out and they're going to try and unload their house at the height of the market. They may take it off the market again when the prices drop. They'd be like, well, no, never mind. I couldn't get, you know, couldn't get top dollar for the house, so I'll just keep it instead. We don't know if that's the case. So once the prices start coming down, we may find the inventory start to deplete. 
But the inventory is rising, which is something to very much consider because once you have a high inventory, prices usually, you know, the supply and demand issues start to come in. So more inventory definitely is something to consider as far as the price is going down. The next thing that I would look for is unemployment to rise. Once you have unemployment rising or massive layoffs, that's when the defaults will start to kick in. And once we start having the defaults, then you're going to start seeing a housing market crash from that. But right now, I wouldn't say a crash. I mean, correction, sure. Like, you know, even like serious correction. But with the inventory rising, and then if we have the ma massive layoffs, like massive layoffs or high unemployment, just people not being able to make their payments, foreclosures, you know, defaults taking place, that's when I would see like the actual crash begin to happen. But right now, yeah, like prices going up, no. Coming down, yeah, probably some in some areas quite extremely. But uh, crashing after the layoffs, once you see the layoffs. What time is it? 1.25. I'm going to give it like five or ten more minutes and I'm going to bail out of here. Uh, I live in Virginia and the businesses are starting to charge a fee for people to pay with the credit cards. Yeah, um... Yeah, I see people who charge a fee to pay with credit cards. Like when you buy gas over here at the uh, at the local grocery store, they have two prices: debit credit and then cash. You know, if you if you pay with that, it's like I don't know, ten cents different or something like that. Okay, uh, credit, credit cards and auto defaults too. Yeah, I'm thinking auto defaults are going to happen quicker. Like, I think a lot of people bought vehicles that they just really simply just couldn't afford. And then, like, you know, you think about it, they were overpriced anyway. Like, they should never have have gone up to the prices they did. And even still, like, it just amazes me, like, how much some vehicles cost. But I, I don't know, that might be... I mean, that might be something that is, like, to kind of consider... You know, they're not manufacturing a lot of vehicles right now. So even if you have, like, a lot of defaults taking place, it could end up being that these vehicles are just worth so damn much money that they don't actually default. They could actually just sell them without actually defaulting on the loan. You know, very much like the, the housing market. I mean, if you have a lot of people who quit making their payments and they went into forbearance, when they come out of forbearance and they didn't find a way to be able to refinance their loan or to pay back all those back payments, then they were gonna end up going into foreclosure. But that was a very unlikely scenario since even if they didn't want the house, the price of the house or the value of the house went up so much they could just sell the house and end up profiting. So they didn't make any payments for a year and then ended up selling the house and walking away with a bunch of cash on top of it too. So like the chances of people going into foreclosure right after the pandemic and the ending of forbearance I, that wasn't a very likely scenario since the prices of the homes were so high up, you know, or so, so far up there, elevated. Well, same thing with the cars. Like, car prices are still quite elevated. Even though I'm seeing the used car market start to come down, even still, like, you know, if you have a car right now and you no longer want to make the payments on it, you might be able to just unload it for what you owe on it. And, you know, even after buying a brand new car, that would be, you know, a pretty good way to just get out of your payments. And the chances of you actually, like, defaulting on your loan would be, like, less of a scenario if you have the elevation of prices on vehicles still up there. I don't know. Did I say all that right? <laughs> okay. What time is it? Okay, 120. I got an hour and 28 minutes I've been out here. Let's get another coffee meet up again. Yeah, Silver Possum, that sounds like fun. Um, I'm a little busy these last few weekends. I've been trying to do stuff with my family before the kids go back to school. So maybe after they get back into, into class or something, we'll set up, a, set up a time over one of the weekends. I have weekends off now. So. All right, I have been reading about the wire card scandal. I payment settlement is still cost costly, and those fintech disruptions aren't yet trustworthy. No, I, I agree, but they're getting there, and that's the whole point is that it's just a matter of time. Like, you know, you have to, you know, you, you have to go through that. You have to go through, unfortunately, you have to set up the system and then you have to have fraudulent things occur in order to come up with the system to securitize it. 
like that's or to make it more sec, you know more secure it's just like anything else out there you're going to find that new technologies fail in many ways and then you have to figure out how to fix those things and that's really what they're doing now um it's just give us some time you know all right i keep hearing that unemployment is strong well employment is strong the unemployment rate hasn't rise but it will just give us some time here all right you're talking about modern man it's 100 percent different animal that even 80 years ago people argue over pretty much everything if you introduce precious metals to the store it would be a bloodbath again like what if the store didn't even know that you were spending precious metals you see like obviously these the the in the end it's all done in dollars like everything is done in dollars that's why like it doesn't matter what you're doing even if you're doing this third party system where you're spending like you know digitized silver coins it doesn't matter when you swipe that credit card it might be talking to a bank that's holding silver on your behalf but what it's going to do it's going to take dollars and tell the other bank here we're depositing these dollars into your account they might take the silver out of your account but they're sending dollars on the other end and that's what the store is receiving so in the end it's all done in dollars no matter what that system i i mean is going to be very difficult to change right there's like i just don't see any changing to that it would be cool if you did have an actual Bitcoin cryptocurrency silver depositing cash, like you had three actual different systems that you could use and you could actually transfer silver to another person through a digitized form and never be participating in the fiat currency of the Federal Reserve note, that system isn't happening. I mean, like it could, but it isn't happening now, you know, and that's that's where I think like. You know, no matter what system you set up, in the end, it's all done in dollars. All right. How would you protect the actual physical gold that you were pegging the digital coin gold? Another Fort Knox. Yeah, you would have to. I mean, that's what it would come down to is that you would have to pay a secure, you know, pay security. You would have to have somebody be able to, you know, store it in a safe or something of that nature. Um I mean, I guess the other way one could go about having a digital gold token and not actually have to have the gold on hand is to have a mine sell the tokens and then mine the gold into circulation like that way. But then again, you would have to trust the mine to actually mine the gold at that point, which again is like, you know, what happens if they can't mine the gold, then you lose the money out on the token. But I guess that would be one way to do it, that you wouldn't have to necessarily trust a place to have gold because the gold would be in the ground. You would have to trust the mine to actually mine the gold. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. I'm going to take one more question here, guys, and then I'm going to bail out and go meet up with a friend. Hey, you were already have negative interest rates and have had them since 1913. It's called inflation. That's all inflation is, is your money buys less over time. So whether you call it inflation. All right, let's see. Um, 10 trillion in debt, $20 silver. Why is silver not $60 right now? Rig, sell the garbage, invest that stagnant money yeah but having having silver having silver isn't an investment and this is this is where i i mean like and not for me anyway like if you're going to invest in silver you should invest in silver mines or silver production of some sort something that actually has some kind of like business to it when you when you buy silver coins when you're buying silver bullion what you're doing is you are buying a speculation you're anticipating that you're going to sell it to somebody for a higher price going into the future so now unless you are planning on selling it for a higher price that's that's the investment i mean i buy it 
with the idea that it's an insurance policy, that I have something that's outside of that third party claim. It gives me the ability to sleep at night that if something that I had made a decision as far as my investment goes fails, at least I have this you know, backing of something that is in my hand outside of that third party claim. That's all it silver really should be. I mean, at least in my opinion, as far as silver bullion goes, it should be the insurance policy, you know, that insurance policy away from that third party. If you want an investment, then you have to look for something that's going to give you some sort of return on it. I mean, not necessarily something that you're speculating on being able to sell for a higher price. I mean, that's, those are two, two wildly different things. So, I mean, at least in my opinion, that is. All right. Um... Precious metals are not on investment to my portfolio. Project Luby. All righty, guys. It was fun hanging out with you. Thank you very much for the super chats. 352 of you came in. 331 likes. Can never tell you how much I appreciate this. You guys are so awesome. Thank you for being here. One more statement here. Silver is simply not used for money as an investment. You would need to understand supply and demand for it, for industry. All right, all-nighter, oh, I gotta say all-nighter. Okay, I don't know what happened to the spelling on that last comment. Hey, all-nighter, it's good to see you guys. All right, um, when are you going to have the next stream? I don't know. Um, Maybe I'll set up an idea that that's a good question. I'll leave it with I'll, that's be the last question that I go with. Um, what I'll try and do is I'll try and set up a weekly day, like where I stream at a particular time, and I'll try and make it a regular thing. Um, I just generally I just kind of stream whenever I get the the chance to do it. I just you know when I have a little bit of free time, and just kind of bored i just come out here and stream but it would be fun to have a set time because i think we could get a lot more people engaged in on the chat hey thank you very much for the super sticker uh, market shift player so that would be a great idea um so i'll see if i can figure out a time it might be more towards the evening i like doing them in the afternoon because i know the east coast and you know other places around the world may not be so you know, eager to be on a live stream at like late at night or something. Like if I was doing a live stream, you know, at six o'clock here on the West Coast, you know, people might be like, you know, tired and not really wanting to sit up for a live stream over on the East Coast. So I'll try and figure out a good time that I could do it on a regular basis. And that wouldn't be so inconvenient that we would miss out on a bunch of uh, people's viewing as well. So, all right. Uneducated Economist, thank you so much. You let me know.